Hello everyone. Today we'll talk about convolutional neural networks and convolutional autoencoders in order to create embeddings of data with image structure. Remember that images are a series of pixel values that are arranged in two dimensions and because of the built-in spatial locality you can look at look for structures locally um, by scanning across an image and this is the main idea of a convolutional neural network. Convolutional neural networks use three basic computational ideas. First, local receptive fields that codify the idea that we, were, we can scan local patches of images. Shared weights that are useful for an operation called convolution which looks for the same structure throughout an image by scanning the image effectively. And pooling, which summarizes whether we found the structure that we were looking for in parts of the image. And these three ideas together are largely responsible for the success of deep neural networks in image processing via convolutional neural networks. First, the idea of a local receptive field is actually a change in the architecture when compared to a fully connected network. A fully connected neural network looks like this, where between every pair of layers is a bipartite graph where each input neuron feeds its activation value to every output neuron in this layer. But a local receptive field avoids this type of full connectivity and therefore, of course, reduces the number of parameters that you need to train for. In a local receptive field, each neuron in the first layer is only responsible for looking at a small, locally connected subset of neurons in a previous layer. And because of this image structure, you can see that this neuron looks only at this patch of the image. And then, the idea of the shared weights allow you to kind of slide over and look for the same structure in the next patch of the image. So the convolution operation which is applied here actually uses a filter. Note that the values of the filter are actually the weights in this local receptive field. And the way the operation works is by sliding over an image and point-wise multiplying by this filter, adding the results to get the resultant value, and then translating the filter and doing it again over and over again. So the convolved feature tells you which part of the image had the highest activation for the filter. And so this is the idea of searching for a particular feature or feature detection with a filter. So it's been shown that deep neural networks actually learn very interesting filters that can go from very low level to very high level features as well as operations on the image. Another couple of concepts. First, stride. Stride refers to how much of the image you slide over. We were previously showing a stride of one where you just shift by one pixel. Um, in either direction. But you can also have a stride of two which slides over the image somewhat faster and moves over by two. Other architectural choices in convolutional neural network include depth. Depth talks about how many feature maps or how many filters you are going to learn in each layer. Each layer can have in parallel multiple feature detectors by way of multiple filters that are learned in the neural network. And finally, padding is an important concept. As you saw, we look at patches of the image, but we never had a patch that was centered right here. But we could do that if we padded uh, with zeros all, all around. So convolutions, I'll reiterate, are implemented with shared weights and shared biases. So in order to slide over the image and perform the same operation again, what we need is these neurons have the same weights as these neurons. 
and effectively perform the same operation. So all neurons on the filter detect the same feature, but with translations. Um, so one question is, why do we do this? First, it greatly reduces the number of parameters, which can help train faster. But second is because this mimics how a human would scan an image. Like think about where's Waldo? You're scanning an image to find a feature. And so this is actually often very useful in addition to saving parameters. Pooling. Pooling is summarizing. So let's suppose that our feature detector detected you know, activations this high when we did the pointwise multiplication and addition that's involved in convolution. But we see that in this region of the image, the highest activation was six. So this is the propensity of the feature here. And so here, this is simply a summarization in terms of the max operation. And you could also use average pooling or other operations to pool and summarize if the feature basically was detected or not in large regions of an image. So if we put this together, you can have a single depth slice, so one filter or one feature being detected all across the image with stride 2 um, and max pooling. Finally, most convolutional neural networks have a fully connected layer that combines the outputs from a particular layer. And this layer can be after many alternations of convolutional layers, pooling layers, convolutional layers, pooling layers. And finally, at the end, we have fairly abstract features that a feature detector has detected. And you can feed those into a fully connected network to decide if we have the right combination of features for some type of classification. Of course, these operations all involve dimensionality reduction and therefore some amount of loss of information. So modern convolutional neural networks usually feature skip connections to give you multi-resolution features um, at many levels. But let's talk for a second about how we would make an autoencoder out of um, convolutional neural networks. So they would have a very similar shape as the normal autoencoders we've been talking about. They have convolutional layers and pulling layers that reduce the dimensionality down, which is pretty obvious. Well, what about increasing the dimensionality back up? We never talked about operations that can do that in terms of convolutions or pooling. One way to do this is called something called a transpose convolutions. This doesn't have anything to do with transposing a matrix. It's just called, called a transpose convolution. The transpose convolution actually learns weights that take the same input and would give you different outputs out. And these two can have some type of a stride. So if you're doing these, this is kind of a decoding type operation where you have one input and you have some kind of kernel that takes this one input and spreads it out into many values and you stride along and do this. So the idea would be that you're centered to yourself somewhere, and you apply a kernel, and you get the output. Um, and you do the same. So in essence, you're taking uh, kernels input values and striding it out from the output cells perspective. From the output cells perspective, you have different input features that are contributing weight to the output, as you see. These features are going to be all around here. One problem with the transpose convolutions, though, is that they lead to somewhat of checkerboard patterns. So an alternative way to do increase in dimensionality is called upsampling. Here you take just this value and sample it up. So you spread it out to four pixels in a higher dimensional image. And now, after you have this, you can use a normal convolution, the kind we talked about in the beginning of this lecture, to alter the values here. So that's called upsampling. And that's actually used a lot more than transpose convolutions. So an example of a neural network that has a very autoencoder-like structure, but it's not quite an autoencoder, is a unit. This features the 
types of operations we talked about. We have convolutional layers. Um, so you can have convolutions that are upsampling layers or regular convolutional layers here. Max pooling layers, which drastically reduce dimensionality. And further convolutional layers. And this is the encoding path. Now the decoding path have upsampling followed by convolution. This is called upcon here. And so here you're increasing the dimensions. And after the upsampling, you have normal convolutions that maintain dimensions or sometimes reduce them. But what's important to note here is the UNet has this kind of U shape and these skip connections. These skip connections are actually important for reconstruction. Otherwise, convolutional neural networks have fairly bad reconstruction, uh, but they do form pretty good embeddings. The reason reconstruction is very important in a UNet is because it's meant to do actually supervised tasks um, whose output is the same dimension as the input image. And a supervised test that's an example of this is segmentation or some kind of image masking. So you see that here's some cells originally. And this is what the convolutional neural network generated as the segmentation. So it actually generated the segmentation mask from which you could derive the boundaries. And so the UNet architecture has been useful in many instances, but originally proposed for segmentation. This is an example of an autoencoder-like architecture in that the output is the same dimension as the input, but with some important augmentations.